read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance Welcome back, lady listeners. Hey, lady listeners. Welcome back. You are here for the second installment of Hide and Seek by Mila Crawford. So thanks for being here. You're going to have to wait for it. Sorry. Not sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, Did you watch the Queen's funeral? No. No, I, did, I didn't even know it was on, honestly. Until I have friends that live in Wales and they watched it and they were like, oh, it was so emotional. And I was like... I saw somebody say that um, her funeral was giving a uh, very Kim Jong Un. <laughs> like no. it was because all of the businesses were shut down, everything was closed, and it was like I don't want to hear how crazy they are about their their country over there. When um, I heard, this is how we react to it. I and this may not be true, but I heard from multiple people that in her funeral stuff, one of her requests was or demands was that Donald Trump was not allowed to attend. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it sounds right. Were American presidents there? I don't know. I just I died. I don't because somebody didn't... said that she was she gets irritated mm -hmm. with him because like I guess when he went over there, mm -hmm. I guess when you walk with the queen, you're never supposed to walk in front of her. Yeah. He just like he, waddled yeah. down the aisle like a fucking <laughs> and he, toddler. And he would like kept stepping in front of her. I don't know if it's <sighs> true. It could be uh, fake news for all I know, but I died. It is, it's her. definitely fake. I don't know. It's just funny to think that could you imagine? Mm -hmm. Getting like a notification of like so such and such said you can't come to their funeral. I'm like, how can they say that they're dead? I'll I was gonna say I like, I was gonna say I, I doubt he would have made the effort to fart in her direction. But okay. So, anyways, I just found it really interesting that I had no idea what was going on. And you know what's funny is is when Meghan Markle got married, I was invested in I that was wedding. Too. I'm not invested in anything else so with the royals in that except wedding. her i, I woke up is. at four in the morning put my tiara on watch that fucker live live and, you know, I and i watched william and kate's too i woke up at the ass crack of dawn for that one i was home on maternity leave and i was like 3 a.m feeding perfect timing i don't i just never been into it but there's something about her that it's very um majestic to me for some weird reason i don't know what yeah. it is yeah i think it's still that fairy tale aspect because you know like kate middleton was considered a commoner i guess even though she wasn't really a commoner i mean she still came from like but i think their story is a little whatever, tainted but... to me because i've heard it stories is, about bears yeah. and he broke up with her and then they got uh -huh. together with megan marvel they're like it was like he's seen her it was an alexa was, Raleigh couple yes and he was enamored <laughs> and you can even see yep. it the way he <clears throat> looks at her that's you can the, see that's it the same Raleigh way kind of love <laughs> the same like way that. um ryan reynolds looks mm -hmm. at blake You'll oh. see it sometimes when he looks over at her. To be fair, though, Ryan Reynolds and Blake Ivy broke up. They did break up. And because I had... she dated Leonardo yeah. DiCaprio to make Ryan Reynolds mad. And mad. it worked. And it worked. And it because worked. he said, from my understanding, was he didn't think he wanted somebody that wanted a family. Mm -hmm. And he didn't think that she was going to want that. Now she's popping out baby number four. Number four. So clearly he was wrong. He keeps getting her pregnant. Uh -huh. That's so hot. I know. <laughs> I love a man who wants responsibility. <laughs> That's I love funny. him so much. Um, so I so the Great Britain, Great British Baking Show is back on Netflix. And this is like I don't even know what season they're on right now, but it's one of those shows where they only drop one a week now. And oh. Netflix has started doing this. And I'm That's just not cool. No, I'm like, look, we have been conditioned to binge. You can't distribute binge level drugs and then say, sorry, we're going to go, we're going to draw this back. See, that's five not, milligrams now. This is why I think this isn't fair. I feel like it's because they don't warn us when shows are dropping. 
And that's why they give us, that's why yep. I feel like that's the yin to the yang. Where other mm-hmm. series, we know when they're starting. This is mm-hmm. coming September, such and such. Netflix, yeah. it comes out of nowhere. It's like, bam, bam, drop, here you go. Whole season. You're like, yep. yes. <laughs> but now no, you're agree, like, yeah. one episode at a time. No, no, it's bullshit. And so, and I told, like, I was talking with friends about it, and I was like, I just can't get invested in it. I can't get invested in once a week. That to me is agony. Yeah, like On just waiting like that, to find out. Yeah, it. to find out. All right, who's going to get eliminated? I just need to see the whole thing. <laughs> you know, I was talking about this too with, um, gosh, oh, with my neighbor the other day. We were talking about like football and stuff, and I said, my cousin he won't watch a football game unless he pre-records it and he knows what the outcome is because he gets so invested in it. He's like, I just got to know what happens before I sit down and watch it. He's like, I'll still watch it. Even if we lose. I understand that. I can understand that. Yeah. I get it. Yep. I understand it. Cause it is. Sometimes I wonder last year I didn't get super invested in Box, I was annoyed with the NFL in general. Yes. Mm -hmm. But this year I was like, I'm doing it. And then Mm -hmm. I'm like, let even this week we won though. I was like, why am I doing this? (laughs) Even though you won. (laughs) You know, I know I'm like, why do I do this? Why do I participate in these Mm -hmm. football games? Because I'm so invested. It's like why am I stressing myself out for four hours every Sunday? Yeah, it's fun to do it. I think that's And then I remind myself, I'm like, well, Melissa, you're an owner now. (laughs) That's right. Your husband did this to you. He made, he's making you participate is what I'm hearing right now. Oh my gosh. Well, I'm back in. Well, in the spirit of the Great British Baking Show, I roasted a whole fucking chicken the other day. And it was the first time I'd ever done this. Well, maybe in my new house. I've done it before, but it's been in other places, but since, I mean, we've been here a couple of years and I've never done it. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to fucking do it. So I did it. I got a whole big ass chicken. It was like a small turkey, basically. And you know how you said that? Mm-hmm. I can't picture what a whole chicken looks like skin. It looks like a small turkey. Does it? That, okay. It looks I, can exactly picture, the same. I was like, I can picture a turkey, but I'm yeah. like, I can't picture... You see them, the rotisserie chicken. Oh, the, the rostini chicken. The, ro- at the rotisserie. End. What did you call it? Rostini. <laughs> rostini. It's rotisserie. Rotisserie. <laughs> I don't know. Yes, rotisserie because it rotates. Okay, that's and what? yeah, they said at the end of the aisles at the grocery store. Yes, exactly. Huh. So that's what it is. Only I did it on my own, but I was really proud of myself because what I did before I cooked the chicken was I took whole garlic cloves, like the whole thing, the whole bunch, and I roasted them in the oven until they got soft. Mm-hmm. And then I like took that soft garlic and I mixed it with butter, and then I rubbed the whole chicken with it, and it yeah. was. He's talking about he marinates all of his meat before he cooks it. Like it's mm. in the uh, it like grosses me out like, when you see it in water whole, and stuff. Yeah, like <laughs> yeah. there's this whole piece of meat in the freaking <laughs> yeah. refrigerator and water. Mm-hmm. It's like it's not water. I'm like, well, there's weird shit floating in it. Is, is that a leaf? <laughs> yep, that is a leaf. It's a bay leaf. Um, I put mine. I did vinegar and salt, and then lemons and limes. That's what the one of the like recipes I looked at they were like this is really good like to wash your chicken with it and then soak it in it so mm-hmm. salt water is always great but yeah when I roasted the thing I stuffed it with like lemon and thyme and rosemary and then I did this rosemary rub on it and it was just fantastic and I was so proud of myself afterwards I was like I am a god I can take on the world so I was trying um, to think if I watched anything on Netflix this week. I did. Yeah. I watched I Just Killed My Dad. <laughs> you did not. Is that the name of a real show? Yeah, that can't be not, real. It's a, I Just Killed My Dad. It's a documentary. Oh, what's Three it Three episodes. Oh, it's what's interesting because it? it opens up and you're on the phone and the guy calls 911. He's like, yeah, I'm calling to report that um, I just killed my father. What the fuck? But, I mean, he is calm as shit. Why did he like, kill yeah, his I dad? shot him and I was like, Oh, is it like oh, an abuse shit. thing? 
it's like it was a weird abuse thing. Like I don't want okay. to give too many spoilers. Somebody want to watch it? But okay, it's like, you're gonna give spoilers. Okay, uh -huh. so I want because I want to know fast. Okay, forward if so want to hear this? He, the dad was, and I, this is something I think that a lot of it's messed with women a lot. Mm -hmm. This emotional control damage. Yeah, and you kind of like snap. Like he doesn't. Well, you find out after like an episode in that he was actually kidnapped from his mother. Like it yeah. is his real dad. Yeah. But the mom got full custody of him and he got him back and took off. So he technically been kidnapped and missing for years. Holy and the shit. dad like never let him go into schooling and he homeschooled him. And what? there wasn't a lot of physical abuse, but yeah. there was a lot of mental like psychological abuse. shit and yeah. some of the people when you're watching they're like well we don't know we think he might be a little bit a sociopath because he is very like blunt about it he's mm -hmm. like i killed my father like mm -hmm. he does not cry about it he does not say anything he's like i felt it was the only option he said i told him i got a, a gun or whatever mm -hmm. and he's like in the cops he said he went in the room he loaded two guns and cocked them shot him and i'm just listening oh, to the story shit. and i'm like holy shit but it's so it just was like that. premeditated but it wasn't no because him and his dad got in a fight and you could see his dad oh, okay. tried to break into the room uh -huh. that he was in the kid was in oh the room. okay yeah mm -hmm. but then the scuffle somehow got out mm -hmm. but even i think if you would have told me he shot his dad in his sleep yeah i still would have been like it was justified Yes. Oh, okay. He'd been so like, and the dad had cameras everywhere. The wife left him, the second wife, for all this abuse and stuff. Oh fuck. So, but like, because he's just like he didn't understand the outside world, mm -hmm. and the cop. He said sometimes the cops would show up, but nothing happened. Yeah, yeah. So it was like, yeah, like then, you say, it's like an abused wife. But his was worse because he didn't even really understand that there was really an outside world. Mm -hmm. Like, really understand mm -hmm. that concept. It was just interesting to watch because then I do wonder if he does have some now disconnect. Yeah. Like an emotion. emotion disconnect yeah. that he may have never be able to form. Well, and if he was taken from his mother, you know, I mean, and obviously this is how his father treated him, you know, maybe there wasn't there were that bonding or that, you know, that yeah, is he necessary. says he barely remembers her. Oh, but it just reminds bad. me a lot of women when they kill mm -hmm. their husbands in their sleep and then they get in trouble. Mm -hmm. Because they're like, You could have called the cops. And I'm like, I just don't see I don't think people get it. Mm -hmm. That fear of this is the only option yeah oh man is to do it in the sleep that's why women kill men in their sleep <laughs> yep <laughs> sleep with one eye open motherfucker because they're fucking petrified <laughs> yeah they're petrified that that's the only way they think that's the only way they can, way get, they can out. get out yeah. yeah or they think that they <sighs> mentally believe that people are mentally beat down mm -hmm. i don't think people realize how crazy the brain can work and what people can make you believe i mean look at fucking cults gosh you know it reminds me kind of like as you're talking about this it reminds me of that movie um room the room or whatever room did you ever watch that movie i can't recall it it was she won an Oscar, I think, for it. And my gosh, I can't even remember her name. I think either the movie won an Oscar or she did, whatever it was. But it's about um it just the movie starts off and it's this woman and she's in this one room and she has like a five year old little boy with her and they're like, you know, they're like playing games and doing stuff and like they're bathing and you know, he's talking about like I'm hungry and she's like, you know, I don't I don't know what to do and and then it's like, as the movie progresses, you realize like, oh, they're in like a shed and they're like being held captive. And she was mm -hmm. kidnapped. And this, yeah. she's been there so many years that this is her child from the man that kidnapped her. Yeah. And so like, and so the kid's been raised in this and it's like, you know, it, there's a small spoiler here, but it's after she's able to get out. It's um, like how they readjust. You know, and how the kid doesn't understand reality because he was never let outside that room. 
So he doesn't know what the the world is, you know? Yeah. You know, that reminds me, and now that you said that, it reminds me of, um, I think it's a show called Evil Lives Here, mm -hmm. where this guy grew up with his dad, and his dad killed multiple women and stuff around him growing up. And mm. after his dad died, he went and he reported it. Like he told the story mm -hmm. of what happened and is a grown man. And he was like, he's like, I just can't explain. Like, I know I should have come forward sooner. I know mm -hmm. he's just like, even as a grown man, I still had this and I live States away from him. I had a fear of him. Mm -hmm. It was just so ingrained in me, even yeah. as a child. He's like, to you, I know it probably sounds crazy. And you're like, why did you allow? He's like, you just don't understand till you're, till you're in it. He's like, this is why I moved all these States away was yeah. to get away from him. Mm -hmm. Cause I was petrified of him. Mm -hmm. It's just interesting God. concept. I don't think people realize or that, the government within the legal system yeah. acknowledges that kind of thing happening, that sort especially of to women. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Especially yeah. to women. Yeah. Gosh, that's so fucked up. Yeah. Let's talk about something happier. <laughs> uh, Mariana Zapata oh, came and dropped the fucking release. I cannot believe that bitch copied us. <laughs> I was waiting on you to say it. I was waiting on it. <laughs> Even though her book is like 600 pages. Oh, shit. Writing Let me it see. For I've a got year. it right here. Hold on. I printed, I, I printed it out. Listen to me. I got the print copy so I could take it to Mexico. Hold on. Mm -hmm. Let me see. She's a thick girl. Look at this She's fucker. She's a nice looking girl. She is thick. When, race, when Gracie met the grump. How cute is this? She is thick. Thick. And it's a superhero book. It's a superhero so book. Like we it. just like, wrote. <laughs> you know what though? She was probably writing this for like two years. And that's we what I said. I was like, weeks. she copied us, even though we wrote ours like three months ago. If that, she's been writing uh, clearly the six hundred page book. She's been writing for over a year. Yeah, it says <laughs> it's five fifty seven on here. Close enough. Oh my god. So I got the print version because I was going to take it with me in Mexico. So we'll see. It's something to read on the beach. I hope that I am so relaxed and in a prone position or whatever, the, the horizontal position the entire time that I don't even think about reading. And I just lay there. That's all I want to do. I just want to go on vacation. But yeah, I actually, what was crazy about the Mariana Zapata, it was like, I was, I thought I was hallucinating. Because it was like 5.30 or whatever, my alarm went off. And it was before I went and got, you know, Lydia up. And so I was just kind of laying there scrolling through my phone. And I was like, oh, let me check Instagram. And I saw Miriam Zapata at the top, like in the little bubble in the story section. And I was like, that's weird. She never posts. And I click on it. And I was like, whose book is that? That's weird. Why is she pro? She never promos anybody's book. And then I just kind of, I was like, I went through like a couple more stories. And I was like. I gotta look at that book again. What? And I was like, oh my God. <laughs> like, it was like my brain couldn't be compute. It was like, I was, I was still half asleep and I couldn't believe it because she just power dropped it. It was like mm -hmm. she opened her pants and laid her dick out. Yeah. Like, it went right to number one. With it, it was like six hours and it yep. went to number one in the Kindle oh, store. One. This bitch didn't and do what's, uh, one and ad. What's a and what's amazing about this whole mm -hmm. situation is it's technically fantasy. And usually it's yep. very hard for contemporary artists to yep. slide to into slide in different genres. Yeah. And so it's different... like, watch me. Watch me do it. <laughs> this is, and it, it's crazy to me. She didn't do one ad, one post, one arc, what? nothing, not anything. She just wrote a book and she published a book. That is the level I aspire to. Let me that's tell you. That's boss level. That's shit. fucking boss level shit. I don't know. I, it reminds me of like Lizzo. It's just like, bam, yes. I do what I want. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's exactly <laughs> right. I love Mariana Zapata. And I did not think for the longest time I would read her. I really never thought I would. And she is so slow burn. Mm -hmm. And there is almost no sexy stuff to pay off. And even at the end of the book, there's not a lot of living in the love. But I was telling somebody the other day, like, why? Uh, they were like, well, why do you read her books? Why do you like them? And I was like, she does such a great job of 
just is so soothing to read her. It's not flowery. It's not difficult. There's not a ton of drama. I haven't read her, but I think what it is, is she makes you become best friends with the heroine. A hundred percent. And you are in that, and that Mm -hmm. heroine becomes your best friend and then you are rooting for her. That's exactly And you're invested in, you're Mm -hmm. invested in all of her thoughts and her Mm day-to-day activities, just like you are with your normal friends and what's going on and what Mm -hmm. was said. And you're just. And her struggles, like, yeah. yeah, like what she goes through, her insecurities. And there's so much truth in her writing. You know, I feel like when she talks about things that maybe she's insecure about or the heroine is insecure about, I feel like that comes from a place in her heart, you know, because it is so relatable. Mm-hmm. So I just, it's crazy. To me. I wonder how many books she's written if it says on here. I don't know. Like she's probably written like maybe 10 10 books. Yeah. That's cool. like that. Isn't that insane? And all her books are basically standalones. Like she's yeah. got two that are kind of in not, not even a series. Like one's just a spinoff of another. And some of them like they're spinoff characters but they're because they're mentioned in other books, but it's like you, they're not even really together at all. They're just basically all standalones with the characters that have been mentioned in other books. Yeah. That's wild to me too. But you know, Lucy Score talked about that, is that she tries to, a couple of times a year, do standalone books. So if people want to give her a try, they don't have to jump into a series. They can just try one. And I was like, that's actually really smart. I thought that was a good idea. So, but yeah, so Mariana Zapata just came through and just, she did the damn thing. So I can't wait to read it. I've heard nothing but good things, but I always hear good things about her. Mm-hmm. So. I mean, I don't doubt that it's going to be, you know, I mean, even though she copied us, it's <laughs> probably going to be pretty good. It, you know, I mean, it, w- it won't be as good as like, you know, a 50 page smutty version, but whatever, it's fun. <laughs> you know, if you're intimidated by Mariana Zapata, please go read Saved by the Superhero. <laughs> like, so like, Both know. books are out now. Yeah. The protective <laughs> <to us. laughs> Take your pick. Take your pick. <laughs> I mean, if you want to ease into I her. Mean, you know what? I would like to call this a little appetizer. Yes. I would prefer you read us first because I don't want to come after her. <laughs> no, you'll be disappointed <laughs> afterwards, let me tell you. <laughs> All right. Well, let's talk about Mila Crawford a little bit. Um, you're about to listen to the second installment of Hide and Seek. I just wanted to remind you that this book is an extended epilogue from Room 22. So if you want more of this book, um, make sure you go check out Room 22, and it's in the series Dangerous Sinners. Um, also, Hide and Seek, the book that you're listening to, has four extra chapters in the ebook. So make sure you grab the ebook if you want more from the story. And her giveaway this week is a signed copy of Bound Together. And if you're looking for something new from her, October 4th, she has a dark retelling of Weathering Heights with an, with an actual happily ever after. So, and that book's called Original Sin. So make sure you check all that stuff. And I think that's it. So let's send into the second installment. Yeah. I'll see you guys on the other side. <laughs> all right. Chapter four. Kean. Moretti better not pull this shit. Stella is ours, all of ours. Not one of us gets to have his name on here while the other two get scraps. Moretti isn't stupid enough to go against me. Sure, he's the boss, but I'm the unhinged one. I'm the one he sends in when he needs someone or something eliminated. He's not dumb enough to think he could replace me so quickly. Enforcers like me are a needle in a haystack. Anyone can kill on demand but only a few can kill on demand, erase all evidence, and be loyal as fuck. My loyalty comes with a price, and that's my queen. Don't fuck with Stella, and you'll come up smelling like roses. Mess with her, and I'll end you. It doesn't matter if he's Axel's daddy. Before I can say anything else, we're saved by two servers placing food on the table. Stella stabs her salad with her fork as she tucks strands of her long brown hair behind her ear, All this is freaking her out. As much as she wanted a wedding, she thought it wasn't possible. But if Stella wants something, we'll make it possible. No matter what. Dad, we want to commit to each other. The four of us. It's not just about Stella, it's about all of us as a family. A unit. 
How are you going to address the invites? Laura asks. Stella looks her mother directly in the eyes. She doesn't flinch, and her voice is steady and clear. We're only inviting 25 people, tops. We only want people there we care about and care about us. Laura places her hand on Stella's. She takes a moment while she stares at her daughter. Worry flashes over her face as she squints her eyes, searching Stella's face for something. Is that what you want, Stella? You always wanted a big, elaborate wedding. Anger creeps up my veins like venom, ready to control my entire being. I don't like when people question Stella or us. It's insulting how most assume that we control her thoughts, feelings, and desires. We don't. What Stella wants is of her free will. Contrary to what most believe, we aren't holding her captive against her will. I shovel food in my mouth to avoid saying anything I might regret later. Out of the three of us, I'm not the one known for controlling my temper. Sensing my unease, Ronan interjects. What someone wants when they're six years old changes in their twenties. The things we plan as children are rarely things we attain in adulthood. That seems to appease Laura. She nods and continues eating her salmon. Anthony stares at her. As long as his wife is satisfied, so is he. Well, we won't stand in your way if this is what you all want. <laughs> no offense, Dad, but you'd have to put us underground to stop us. We aren't here asking for permission, we're here asking our parents to come as guests. As long as it doesn't affect business, I couldn't care less who you're fucking. Anthony. Laura's voice is barely a whisper, but her embarrassment is evident. She drops her head and busies herself eating her food as if hoping the ground will open up and swallow her whole. I chuckle. Laura is married to a monster and still has a hard time accepting who he is. Not my Stella, though. She knows exactly who we are and loves us regardless. That's how I know we'll last. We have total acceptance. She doesn't always agree with us, but stands by us, no matter what. I wonder if Laura would be by Anthony's side if she knew about the blood on his hands. We want to get married in the forest behind the house, Axel says. The place holds meaning for us. You two don't have to do anything. I'll take care of everything. We just need the space. Anthony wipes his mouth with the white cloth napkin at the table. I don't see any problem with that. Axel slaps the table and smiles at his father. Great, so we'll see you Saturday. Something flickers between Laura and Stella. Whatever it is, it must be something Laura approves of because she nods her head and smiles. Dear, I think we can get on our way and leave the kids to themselves, Anthony says, getting up from the table and offering Laura his hand. It doesn't matter that her food is still sitting on her plate. The man wants to go, and what she wants doesn't seem to be a consideration. Laura smiles, takes his hand, and walks with him without a word. I take a sip of my drink and turn to Axel. I may be a sadist, but that man is an asshole. Stella smirks. That is your future father-in-law you're talking about. I know I'm involved with his son, but I don't like how he talks down to your mother. That shit doesn't bother you? She shrugs. She seems happy, and as long as she's happy, it's not my place to question anything. I mean, it's not like people don't judge us. We aren't exactly a nuclear family. Yes, but I at least let you finish your fucking food. Stella smiles, her eyes flickering with humor. Kean, you belted me while I ate like a dog at your feet. You liked it. As I recall, you were dripping wet and begged me to fuck you up the ass while Ronan ate you out. Red creeps up her skin, and she casts her eyes down. I grip her jaw, forcing her to look at me. I think we'll pack up the rest of your meal and have a repeat of that night. Chapter 5 Stella Kean opens my car door for me, like usual. Since being with these three, I've never had to carry a bag or open a door. Kean, Ronan, and Axel may treat me like a whore between the sheets, but in the streets, I'm nothing but a lady. Unless they're railing you in the bathroom or forcing you to drink cum in front of your mother. Regardless of their sexual needs, they treat me like a princess. And it's not like I don't love their depravity. I live for it. I was going through the motions until I met them. I was living in monochrome and they were technicolor. They ignited something in me that has me on top of the world, looking down at the peasants below. Let's be real. 
Most women would love three men to fuck them stupid while treating them like the most precious thing on the planet. The way they gaze at me like they could devour me and keep me in bulletproof glass makes me feel invincible. As soon as I'm seated, Kian leans forward and buckles me in, placing a chaste kiss on the top of my head. The kiss is the calm before the storm. Kian is super sweet right before he does something insane, usually involving me. This juxtaposition would be a red flag with most men, but, but even though Kian is insane, he's also the sweetest, most loving man on the planet. He never allows the rage and inner turmoil he struggles with from growing up with a drug-addicted mother to touch me. He's loving and even-tempered with me, except when we're having sex. In those moments, he's wild and passionate. I love both sides of Kian, his entire self. There isn't one thing I'd change about him because if I did, he wouldn't be Kian anymore. My eyes connect with Axel's through the rearview mirror. His face is plastered with a shit-eating grin. Put your legs on the dashboard and spread them. You cannot be serious, Axel. Everyone will see. Like I give a shit. I own a gun and a knife. You can't go around killing and maiming people when you force my pussy on display. They should know better than to look at something that doesn't belong to them. Sometimes I worry about these three. They place me in these compromising positions because, in part, all three are exhibitionists. But they also hate the idea of any other man looking my way. It's why we never partake in anything in the sex club Axel owns. He thinks bloodbaths would be bad for business. So I sit with my feet on the dashboard, exposed in daylight in a rather busy parking lot. Their demands are like hot embers against my skin. I need this from them as much as they need it from me. Maybe that's why we work so well. Our different parts are useless when separate, but together they form a bond forged in perfection. Axel's warm breath flutters against the shell of my ear, igniting my body. That's my good girl. If you close your legs, you'll regret it. Remember, Stella, good girls get rewards and bad girls get punished. I nod as Kian starts the ignition and drives. My eyes travel along the streets, praying no one dares to look at me, exposing myself. I'm the one committing the crime, but I worry for anyone who dares point it out. At a stop sign, my fears are realized as a young man gawks at my open, exposed pussy. I scan the area. There's no one there. Until there is. A young guy on a motorcycle. At first, I think Kian's going to drive. The guys are crazy, but they aren't that crazy. Then the guy opens his mouth. How much for your whore? The car comes to a screeching halt, jolting my body. Kian's the first one out of the car, like usual. He's always the one who goes into a quiet rage. The quickest way to bring out the killer in him is to say anything offensive to me. I blink, and the guy is off his bike. Kian's fist flies into his face in a rage. Blood splatters on the floor. You don't fucking put your eyes on her. You don't talk to her, and you sure as fuck don't call her a whore. Who the fuck do you think you are? The man obviously cannot fight or defend himself. Kian doesn't wait for an answer and takes out his knife. Before he can do anything, Ronan and Axel are on him, dragging him off. Get the fuck off me, Kian shouts. Axel frames Kian's face as he desperately tries to get him to calm down. Kian, get a grip, man. We can't just fucking off someone in broad daylight. Ronan digs into the guy's pocket before flipping through his wallet with his foot on the guy's chest. I know Ronan isn't keeping the pressure off by how the man whines and moans. Vinny Price. Listen here, Vinny. I'm going to keep this driver's license for insurance. You talk to anyone, and we'll be back to kill you and everyone you love. Got it? I got it! Got it! Vinny screams as Ronan kicks his side and spits in his face. Watch who you call names next time. Chapter 6 Stella The girl facing the mirror isn't the same person who stepped out of the car at the Moretti mansion. The insecurity that used to run rampant through me, the fear, the hesitation, have vanished. I can't believe I'm getting married. My mother's hands shake as she adjusts my veil. Are you sure you want to do this? I know the new men in our lives can be intimidating. I turn to my mother, wanting her to see the sincerity in my eyes and the conviction in my voice. Yes, 
I was floating, and even when alone, I was lost. I didn't know it until I found my home. Those three are it for me. Home. They may not be perfect, but they're perfect for me. Can you understand that? They fulfill me. We might not be conventional, but we fit. We're puzzle pieces, and the picture's not complete until we're connected to each other. My eyes roamed to my mother's withered hands, evidence of the years of hard labor. Her eyes are glassy with unshed tears. All I've ever wanted for you is to be happy and loved. I am. Those three would do anything for me, Mom. They'll burn the world down to protect me and keep me safe. I get all the support and encouragement I could want. They cherish me and worship the ground I walk on. They love me, Mom, more than their own lives. I'm happy and loved. Then let's walk you down the aisle. I'm not sure if you'd call this an aisle. I take my mother's hand as we walk out the veranda doors to the forest where it all started. Oh, wow. Isn't it beautiful? My mom asks. The guys did it all. They made sure it was perfect. I take in the white rose petals on the ground and the newly built high gazebo under the large lush trees. But the best part is my three beautiful men standing there gazing at me like I'm the sun rising above the clouds on a cold winter's day. Holding my mother's hand for dear life, I walk toward my future full of love. Kian's large tattooed hand frames my face. I would say you look beautiful, but the word doesn't do you justice. Axel smirked before kissing my cheek. I can't wait to rip the wrapping paper off you so I can get to my present underneath. Ronan bends down, kissing my hand. I'm blessed to be spending my life with you, Rabbit. Okay, okay, this sappy shit is freaking me out. Well, except for you, Axel. You kept the cocky shit in your sappy line. Let's get married already. Ronan winks at me before turning to our loved ones. Thank you all for being here today. As you can see, this wedding is a little unorthodox, just like we are. Family is something you are born into or something you forge. I've been blessed because today I get to say I do to the three people I love. Technically, what we want to do isn't legal in all 50 states, so we've thrown a different shindig. Ronan eyes Kian, who's slicing his hand with a blade. We're going to profess our love to family and friends and bind ourselves to each other our way. Kian passes the knife to Axel, who does the same thing. He hands it to Ronan, who repeats the action before finally the knife gets to me. The blood of my three men trickles from the blade, landing on the white rose petals. I inhale the fresh air around me as I slice my palm. I hold up my hand as each man presses his palm against mine before merging them into each other. We link our hands, forming a circle, and chant in unison, Today I marry my best friends, my lovers, my confidants, my soulmates. Until death to us part, and even then, we'll find each other. Should we kiss? Axel asks, his voice low and husky. Kian and Ronan gaze at each other before they all turn to me. I laugh, throwing my arms around them, pulling them to me before I crush my mouth to theirs, and we kiss. A four-way act of debauchery in front of everybody. Chapter 7 Kian We got you a present, wife. I dangled the diamond choker in front of her. A thin band with a larger diamond circle in the front. You did? I didn't get you anything. I pushed back from her, placing the necklace around her neck and clasping it. You're about to. I pull the vial from my pocket and cut her chest with the same knife we used during the ceremony. My cock thickens at the sight of her fresh blood oozing from her skin. I want your blood, sweet girl. My hand trembles as I place the vial under the cut. I watch as it pools drop by drop until it fills. You have your collar, and I've got mine. I'm yours, Stella, tied to you in every single way. There's no escaping me. Ronan pulls on his necklace, a gold chain. I had a lock of your hair melted with gold to make the chain. Her eyes fall to Axel, who has a wicked grin on his face. He tugs at his necklace. Remember when I made you squirt into that water bottle? Stella nods. 
There's an artist who makes jewelry from bodily fluids. I got her to make this from your cum. Now that's taken care of, I think it's time we consummate this union of ours. I say, and the door rattles as I slam Stella against it and push my body into hers. She coughs as my forearm presses against her throat, holding her in place. My cock hardens when she flinches from the pain I inflict by fisting her upper thigh. Stella is so pretty when in pain. I want to cut you, Stella, to bathe you in blood and capture your pain on canvas for the world to see. I press my cock against her and she shivers. I want you to scream for me as I cover you and come. Her fingers trace the minor cut on her tit and she laughs. <laughs> I think you already cut me. God, I love her laugh. It's the sweetest sound in the world. For someone like me who's rarely seen light or goodness, it's rare to hear something so pure. I crush my lips to hers, letting the taste of her flood my senses. I could get lost in Stella. She has the power to make me forget everyone and everything but her. She's my calm in a frantic world. I love the guys, but Stella is the center of my heart. Without her, I couldn't function. I couldn't survive. She slips her tongue into my mouth, and my teeth sink in, digging into the soft flesh, drawing the blood my monster craves. Few women could handle me and be open to giving me what I need, but Stella gives to me selflessly. I love you, I whisper against her pillowy lips. She brushes my mouth with a smile. I know. My hands circle the collar she's wearing as I clip on the dog leash. Now get on the floor, whore, and present me your ass. Stella drops on all fours without hesitation. Her soft hair is like silk under my hand as I caress her head, tugging on the leash and moving her into the apartment. Good girl. I'm so glad we got her naked before we collared her, because the view of her big, round ass is out of this world. She looks stunning in her wedding dress, but her naked body is the finest piece of art. Nothing on this planet is more attractive than her naked form. Ronan's voice booms behind us. Here we go again with Kian's weird fucking shit. Stella, do you like your current position? She smiles, her dark eyes finding mine. Why don't you come and find... Her words are cut off with a moan. Axel growls. She's gushing like a bitch in heat. She likes it all right. Ronan, why don't you fill our girl's mouth? She looks like she's hungry for some cock. Ronan's thick cock is out of his pants so fast, I'd swear he was the flash. He glides the tip along Stella's lips. Her mouth falls open, and she sticks out her tongue. Such a good girl, rabbit. Allowing your brother to suck on your juicy pussy while I stuff your mouth. Do you want my cock? Stella pushes onto her knees, extending her tongue, and trying to touch the tip of Ronan's cock. Then beg for it, sweetheart. Tell me how much you want me to feed it to you. Please, she begs, followed by a moan from Axel's face attached to her cunt. Please let me suck on your thick cock. Axel's head bobs, and I know his tongue is working overtime, because tasting Stella's pussy is like eating a damn Michelin star meal. Nothing, and I mean nothing on this planet, tastes as good as our girl. Bring our pet into the living room. She's going to be on her knees a good long while, and since it's her wedding night, we should make it a little more comfortable for her. Ronan smirks as he takes her leash in his hand and tugs. Be a good girl. Let's see you crawl like a dog for your daddies and big brother. Only if Axel keeps up what he's doing with his tongue. Don't worry, little sister. Your big brother's tongue is nestled nice and tight, Axel mumbles as they start crawling across the floor. Get under her, Axel. Stella, sit on his face, I demand. I'm not sitting on his face. I, I'm too big. Rage fills me. We've been through this shit. We aren't pussies. We can handle a woman, especially our woman. Her body is fucking perfect. Every roll, scar, and dip in her skin, fucking perfect. I turn to Ronan. Shut her up, Ronan. I don't have to tell him twice. As Stella is about to talk, he shoves his cock in her open mouth, gagging her. I rip off my belt, wrapping it around my hand. Sit on his face, Stella. You can do it yourself or I'll make you. 
Choose wisely, sweet girl, because one of those options will hurt. You looking to be punished on your wedding night? Axel doesn't give her a choice. He grips her hips and forces her down on his tongue. My pants pull on the ground, and I get behind her, wrapping my belt around her throat and securing it. Suck my dick, Axel. Get it ready to fuck our girl's tight cunt. Stella's head falls back, and she releases Ronan's cock as I pull on the belt. We're going to switch up our positions. Ronan, lube your ass and get on Axel's dick. Stella, turn around. Stay seated on Axel's face, but turn around. She swings her legs, repositioning herself on Axel's mouth, while facing Ronan, who's lining up his asshole with Axel's cock. I've always loved watching my two best friends bang, but adding Stella to the mix is my personal porno dream come true. I stand behind her, tugging the belt to yank her head back. There's something about watching an angel unravel for the devil. This perfect, beautiful thing we get to make dirty just for us. Stella deserves to be on a pedestal, and she is most days. But during sex, we need her to bend for us, to be under our feet, and she does it perfectly. That's love. Her giving us what we need so easily, without a fight, and with pleasure. I dip my head and kiss her, consumed with my desire, need, and deep love for her. I want to devour her, get lost in her love in such a phenomenal way that it will shatter me. She moans as I gently nip her top lip between my teeth, tugging it as I break our kiss. I'm going to need you to slobber all over Ronan's dick like the hungry cock whore I know you are. Do a good job, baby. I want you to see tears running down your pretty face. Stella nods. She bends and opens wide, engulfing Ronan's thick dick in her sweet mouth. You are so pretty when you're a dirty slut, Stella. I praise her. Choke her, Ronan demands. He holds her head flat against him so her chin is pressed on Axel's stomach while her nose is at Ronan's V. I yank the belt back, restraining her between Ronan and me and forcing her head down on his dick while he bounces up and down on Axel's cock. Saliva drips from the side of her mouth as she makes strangled gagging sounds. God damn, that's good, Rabbit. You're doing so well, pretty girl. Such a good girl. You like choking on my cock, don't you, baby? Ronan grunts. She jerks as I slam my cock into her, her body a perfect symphony with all her holes perfectly played by our mouths, cocks, and hands. The sensation of being hugged by her tight cunt is unreal. My dick has never known more pleasure than when it's inside Stella's pussy. Some might find how we play extreme, and many can't handle it, but this fuels us. It extends our love and trust in each other. She's safe, even in our debauchery. We would never dare to cross her boundaries or ignore her safe words. If I believed I'd actually hurt her, I'd cut off my dick. Hell, I would kill the guys, two men I love more than myself, for her. But like us, Stella loves the games. She thrives on them. She's the center of our universe, the air we breathe, and she knows it. That's why she puts on the show when we treat her like a whore in private. So wet. You love being used like a whore, don't you, sweet girl? I growl. Stella bobs her head as she tries to push her ass back on my cock. Be careful, slut. You don't want to choke yourself to death for a little dick. The belt falls off her neck from Ronan's swift movements. I grip the smooth leather in my hand. You want daddy to give you a little pain, Stella? Your sweet pussy needs that extra push before you gush and drench Axel's face. I want that cum, sweet girl. I want Axel to spit it in my mouth so I know it was our cocks that made you piss cum for us. I raise my arm and bring the belt to her back. The red mark left in its wake makes my dick harder and my thrusts more forceful. I want her to cum while my belt reddens her creamy flesh. I yearn for my marks on her skin, for her to know what we did to her for days. She's ours. Chapter 8 Stella They say love is messy, and in my experience, it's true because my life with these three men is the leading definition of mess. But it's also the rainbow after the storm. The love they show me is unparalleled. 
It's passionate, desperate, feral, and consuming. I hope everyone knows love like this because it's the kind of love that allows you to feel safe, cherished, and wanted. To an interloper, it might look like I'm being abused, but they don't see how it fuels me. To me, it's not abuse, it's desire. These three go mad with lust for me. They wouldn't do this with another, and they would never look at another woman. Kean's belt slashes my back, violent and untamed. It should hurt, but it doesn't in the way you'd think. The marks he leaves on me are a demonstration of his love. My trust in him allows him to do it freely. People think they manipulate me, but it's far from the truth. I'm not their prisoner. I'm their warden. I'm in full control, the center. I give each of them a part of me where they all give me their whole. I try to relax my throat to accommodate Ronan, but there's no point. He's so big that no matter what I do, the invasion is hard and fast. Pain shoots from my scalp as Ronan's powerful hands yank me off him, allowing me a moment to take in some air. He pulls my hair, forcing my eyes to where Axel is fucking him with vigor. Mascara runs down my face from him choking me with his cock moments ago. Spit overflows from my mouth, falling between us on Axel's abdomen. Ronan tugs viciously at my hair, forcing my neck back and my eyes to land on his face as he peers down at me. I love watching you drool, rabbit. It shouldn't be hot when you look like a depraved slut, but it is. Does it feel good having your brother lick you while Kean plows that tight cunt? Yes, I pant, desperate to catch my breath. Axel moans against my clit, raising his hips and pushing his cock further into Ronan's ass. I think Axel has a little something for you, pretty girl, Ronan says, moving off Axel. I'm confused for a moment until teeth bite my clit and ropes of cum fly from Axel's cock straight into my face. Ronan pulls my head back, smiling down at me. I bask in the praise, knowing I look ravishing, perfect, and beautiful to him. He doesn't say a word. He bends and his tongue laps at my face, collecting the cum. I don't need instruction. I open my mouth wide and gaze at the long rope of cum traveling from his mouth to mine. Such a good girl, Ronan says as he takes in my open mouth with Axel's cum on my tongue. Hold it, baby. Don't you dare swallow. A look passes between Ronan and Kian before I'm hoisted and moved to the couch, where Kian is now lying. I'm placed across his lap where Kian smears lube between my ass cheeks and glides one finger inside me. Ready to get all your holes filled tonight, sweet girl? My entire body is on fire, a raging inferno burning only for them. My men, my husbands, my everything. Cool liquid drips between my ass cheeks. Put her on my cock, Ronan. I'm not finished with her yet. Kean instructs. Ronan places me on Kean, but this time it's not my pussy being impaled by his enormous cock. Kean slowly presses the tip of his cock into my ass, before pushing in further until he's fully sheathed. Don't just stand there, Ronan. She's got another open and waiting hole. Gotta keep our girl satisfied. Ronan's lips brush against my lips, and he whispers, You okay, Rabbit? Can you take more? I nod, unable to talk with Axel's cum still in my mouth. Ronan smiles as he lines the tip of his cock with my center. That's a good girl. You're doing so well taking us the way you are. He growls as his cock fills me. So tight, baby. I can feel Kean pushing up your ass. Fuck. The two of them work my body, pushing it between them. I'm on the edge, and I'm not sure I can take any more. Kiss me, Kean demands, yanking my head back and taking my mouth with his. Axel's cum moves from my mouth to his, and he kisses me with such force that it's like being swept away by a tornado, wild, dangerous, and dominating. Axel's voice infiltrates my sex-crazed brain. Looking good, little sister. Bouncing on two cocks like a good little whore. I pass the rest of the cum to Kian and watch as he swallows. It's so hot because out of the three of them, Kian never bottoms, and he rarely swallows their cum. While Axel and Ronan are completely into anything in our relationship, Kian has his limits. So on the rare occasion he lets go, I get so turned on that I could orgasm just from that. I'm about to tell Kian how hot I found that kiss when my entire body ignites like a volcano. 
Axel's tongue is on my clit, manipulating my nerve endings into a frenzy. My hands dig into his hair, pushing him down on me while Ronan fucks my pussy and Kian takes my ass. Lick that pussy, big bro. Show your little sister how much you love her, Kian demands. Fuck, you're such a dirty whore, sis. Fear catapults through me as Axel growls, tugging my clip between his teeth. Out of the three, Axel is the most intense. His need to mark me is unpredictable and heightens my fear. The more frightened I am, the more it eggs him on. Axel, I warn. Shh, he coos into my pussy, his teeth holding my clit hostage. He lifts his lips off me. You know you'll like whatever I do to you, sis. Trust Big Brother to make your slut cunt feel good. Axel moves back to my clit, sucking it deep into his mouth and making me see stars. My orgasm hits with such intensity that my body might combust. Most people think Kian is the psychopath, and on paper that's true. But when it comes to sex, Axel is the one who always puts me on edge, makes me worry. With Kian, I know I'll get pain, that he'll make me bleed or leave welts on my body. With Ronan, I'll get pleasure and complete worship. But with Axel, I'll get an animal. Sometimes he'll be sweet and comforting, while other times he'll rip me into a million pieces just because he can. I'll take everything from them because it's the only time I've been free. These men aren't perfect, but they're perfect for me. So I take it all because they give me oxygen and I need it all to breathe. Axel doesn't let go of my clit as Ronan and Kian both fuck in my holes. The three of them are focused and it doesn't matter that I'm sensitive. They show no mercy as they ravage me. My breasts are trapped in Axel's hands and he pinches my nipples viciously. The pain is a reward and a punishment to my clit, sparking aftershocks from my orgasm. Kian holds my ankles, my feet over my head, as he and Ronan work their cocks in deeper, proving they own me. My pussy and ass are slaves to their cocks. They fuck me like they've granted me access to walk through the pearly gates and be devoured by God and the devil. Axel slams his hand on my throat, pressing hard enough that even if I wanted to say anything to stop him, I couldn't. He's shutting down my brain, letting me relax by pushing the human brain out and unleashing the animal. His hot breath moves to my ear, his ragged breathing heightening the sensations. You're such a good slut, sis. Such a perfect, pretty slut. I scream as he bites at my neck like a vampire, ripping into my flesh with his teeth, and once again my body explodes into a beautifully violent orgasm. Fuck, Ronan growls. I'm going to fill you with cum. I shut my eyes, getting lost in the sensation, my cheek stings from a slap, forcing them open again. Look at Ronan, sis. Know who owns this body. Know we're yours. For the rest of your life, we'll make you come like a goddess and a whore because both parts of you are ours. Kian lifts me off his ass, and his cum drips and hits the hardwood floor below us. Fuck, I love watching cum leak out of you. It's fucking hot seeing you being a whore for me. My body flies off Kian, and I find my head on the floor. I move my hands beside my head for balance. My legs are spread wide with Ronan's hands on each ankle as he plows into me mercilessly. His thrusts are fast and furious, hitting my G-spot and pushing me toward the brink. Fuck! Ronan roars as his hot cum flows in me. He doesn't pull out, hips still moving against me as a finger, I'm not sure whose, is on my clit, coaxing another orgasm. But this one is a crescendo, something mind-blowing and life-changing. Fuck! I scream. A slap against my pussy is the push I need as Ronan removes his cock and replaces it with his tongue. I come in waves, drenching his face. We lie there in the aftermath, wrapped in blankets with me cuddled in the safety of their arms. I love you, Ronan. I adore you, Kian. I worship you, Axel. I gaze at my men, Kian, the fire that makes me burn, Ronan, the water that makes me calm, Axel, the wind that sweeps me away, and me, the earth that grounds them. This has been Room 22, Hide and Seek by Milla Crawford, read for you by Jarman Day. 
Welcome back. Welcome back. So like I said, make sure you enter this week's giveaway. Check out the new release, Original Sin, and get some more of this in the ebook, Hide and Seek, with more extra chapters. Um, up next week, we have, oh my gosh, I don't even have, we're, we're about to record for this one, aren't we? Lauren Smith, she's brought us a, a brand new book, which was great. She actually had the audio herself and she just sent it to us. <laughs> she was like, I have an audio book. Can I play it on the podcast? I was like, you absolutely can. Yep. So it's called Fit to be Stapled. I'm super excited. So we'll see you guys next week and we'll talk right. about it. Tell them what to do. Fuck your day up. Make sure your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Bye. Read me romance. Read, read me romance.